Hello, my name is Roland Waits, and this is Gordon Smiley's Death in 2019 IndyCar. Part 2. The last half of that video got bumped because the card in the film was too full and it just stopped recording. So we're back into it. Last thing I said in that video is you will never believe where I saw this problem in the car. And the reason I said it is because it's exactly where I said you would not see it. Which is in this view of the car coming around the track. Now, the best video I found on YouTube about this, uh, the video, is uh, called uh, Gordon Smiley by Joe Man Goku. It's been on uh, YouTube for 10 years. There are other videos that uh, say that they're high def, but when it gets into the crash, when it gets around here, they pixelate, they, they smear the they smear the image so you can't see it as well. In any case, what you need to do when he comes around the corner, what you need to do is not be looking at the front wheel. You need to be looking at that rear wheel. What you need to be looking at is the relationship of the face of the wheels to each other. Because that's a strange thing about any car. Uh, there's nothing more beautiful than watching the Indy car on a sunny day going around that turn, those two, those two bit large turns at Indy, uh, and the way the sun plays off of them, because if it's working right, the car's working right, and the driver's not yanking around on a wheel, those two tires, they have the same kind of presentation to the sun. Same thing going on here. Stare at that back wheel as that car comes around the track, and I want you to keep your peripheral vision open to this wheel right here, that front wheel. And as it there's there's a tree right in the middle of this thing where all the trouble happens right behind it. But when he clears the tree, remember I was talking about uh, when you're on the track. This is the back of the car, and you go across the painted line and you turn the factor of 10 here to 14 because you transferred the load of the tire. This was an eight ran over some paint and then you transferred the load of the tire over to here to 14 which makes this tire now um, doing all the work and it just won't do it well then this also makes this tire slide so that's what he winds up with he winds up with a situation where he, when he clears this tree the car this tire starts transfers the load, the car starts sliding. Now, unlike a regular car, this is a ground effects car, and it has two skirts on it like that. It has a, a channel under the car, there's actually two channels, but this is essentially a representation of what it is on the track. And there's a vacuum in here. Well, what happens is the car is sliding up the track. He's got a huge amount of downforce from the, the uh, ground effects and from the wings it's trimmed out but he's still got the downforce plus he's got working for him is the uh, the angle of the turn that he's going around so it's trying to force the car down on the track too unfortunately he gets this slide slide sideways and he gets this moment where it goes like this and once it does that that's the one thing about ground effects that I don't think they probably ever talked to the drivers much about because they scared the hell out of them is ground effects Ground effects works great until it fails. And when it fails, it fails in a lot of different ways, but primarily it pops the car up off the track. In this case, it didn't pop the car up off the track because he had so much rotational and front waist force uh, going around the track, it was sort of keeping him in line. But the car was, once it came across here, it was off the track. And he was feeling it too because if you stare at this back wheel and you watch when he clears this that front wheel he goes like this I mean you can actually see it he goes like this and the car doesn't do much it kinda it kinda does a little this and then it kinda it doesn't really respond to the wheels and what he's doing is he just found out oh my god my tire my front tires are off the track he's actually airborne here 
That's why when you look at this, you don't see any tire tracks until here. This is where you see tire tracks. I'm going to get to that, but I want to get to this first. The car is airborne. He's, he's, he goes like this. And the reason he goes like this is because he's anticipating resistance from the tires from the contact of the road. But he's not on the road. He's actually detached the ground effects, and now the car, when you detach ground effects like this, say this is a ground effects channel, and this is the back, okay? This whole thing lives by running air out here very fast, okay? And that, that you have a narrow channel there, and you have a large channel back here, and it creates a suction. It also lives off of these uh, skirts that it has. But when you get sideways, what happens, if you ever allow air to get under these skirts, what you wind up with is you wind up with turbulence in here. And as soon as you slow the flow of air out the back of the car, and you have not slowed the flow of air into the car, guess what you've got? you got a naturally born hovercraft situation going here. So, it, along with the turbulence coming up under the skirt, which is, the air is tearing under it, trying to keep it off the ground, now you've got air being forced into the front of the car here, you've got the down forces tremendously reduced from the ground effects, and the car is designed to work with ground effects, that's why the wings are so trimmed out, because they don't need a lot of wing if you've got the ground effects working, but if it fails, you're hosed. And Gordon Smiley just hosed himself. He came down around this corner way too fast. He went down below. There's a, uh, a tire line that all the racers used in Indy. And, I mean, you can see it. There's a black tire line. Black, black tire line. And that's where all the racers raced. That's where they left the rubber. That was the fastest and safest way around that corner. But Smiley is three feet down the track from it. He's actually, when he goes into the corner, he's okay. But once he gets down here, he runs not only over this white line. This is the white line. He not only runs over the 200 feet of white line, he runs even further in on it. And then he runs... Uh, he. He detaches the car. Once he detaches the car, he's in a really interesting situation because now he's driving an airborne race car in the, in the layer of air is probably uh, a half an inch, if that, at 190 miles an hour. And the only thing that's keeping him going is the guidance of those wheels to the air that's going in the channels because the tires are not truly attached to the track. And that's what we see later on here when the car does this number. He gets this. You, you really can't see this motion. It's not as graphic as this, but it's there. It's, this whole thing with this break in the, uh, the continuation of this kind of screws with it. But you see this kind of, when he, you look at those rear tires, you look at those front tires, and you see those two front tires that the car kind of goes like this. It kind of goes whoop. And one of the things you've seen this, if you've watched any rushing uh, driver videos on an icy road, is someone that can be driving down an icy road, and for some reason they get a pulse through the car. And they react to it. And once they react to it, they've set in motion uh, a a wave of force through the car. Okay, front. You get this motion, so the person turns the wheels like this. Oh my God, look, I, I need this to go this way. So he, well, what you do is you set a, a, a wave of motion through the car because the car goes like this. You get this wave of motion. It hits the back of the car and it comes back up. And that's where you get this secondary bang. You get this wink, bang. And then that's where you get this uh, change of motion that becomes uncontrollable, the slide that they can't recover from. Because you induce energy into the car that travels through the car, bang, hits the other side of the car, bang, hits the other side of the car, and then you've got a problem that it induces itself into the travel of the car through the tires onto the icy road. 
Same thing with this here. He's doing 190 miles an hour. He went down on a white line. He detached that inside tires from the track. He still got the ground effects. Unfortunately, once those tires start sliding sideways, the outside tires can't handle it, and they detach. And but the the way that the curve is, it's maintaining the integrity of the vehicle as far as its direction. But the ground effects is now compromised. And what happens is you wind up with a car right here that's floating, and he gets this kind of. It's a. I'm telling you, if you're looking at this, and you look at those two tires the two front tires, you will be astonished at how far those tires go before he spins over here and finally corrects it like this. And I'm going to tell you how he corrects it. This is amazing because what he does is he turns the tires like this and what he does, he it, it's not the front tires touching the asphalt that turns the car. It's like a great big flying jet. And these are like ailerons on the back of a jet. They are conducting air into the Venturis. And once he reestablishes that car straight and in the direction, because it's going this way at 190 miles per hour, another thing I want to say is I don't think he ever got off the gas. I think that one of the things that he did embrace was the fact that if you got off the gas, you were accepting that you were going to hit the wall, you are accepting that you gave up control of the vehicle, and that by the time you got off the gas anyway, it was pointless because you're going to smack the wall a ton. Because he wasn't going to give up. That day was the day he was going to make a pole position or die trying. That's what he said. Um, there is a video on YouTube. I, I recommend everybody watch. It's called Who, Who Was Gordon Smiley? By... Um, NASCAR man history. NASCAR man history. This is one of the most beautifully written or beautifully organized bios of a race I've ever heard. And it, it humanized Gordon Smiley. It explained what his attitude was on that day. It explained so many things about why he would become so frustrated that he would put his life in so much jeopardy doing something like this that everybody looked at him and said, that's so stupid, why did you do that and kill yourself? But the bottom line is, was this guy was no rookie to racing. He had a very singular goal. He wanted to race in Formula One racing. He didn't want to race in any car. He didn't want to race in uh, Trans Am. He didn't want to race in SCCA, although... He did all those other things. He raced in Formula One Aurora series in Europe and did well. The things that he did to try to get into Formula One are astonishing. I mean, the guy was always broke until he got somebody that backed him in IndyCar. And he fought and fought and fought to chase his dream. And he did have racing skill and he was smart, but he was very, very impatient. And he was, by the time this race came around, he was very, uh, it even says in the bio that he was rather bitter, but not at the racers who did better than him that he raced with in Europe. He was just bitter about the whole thing, that it didn't look like he was ever going to get into Formula One, and that no matter how hard he tried, it seemed that his head was up against the stone on this thing. So another thing about this crash is that... Uh, this was not the last qualifying run that he could have made. He could have stayed another week and made another qualifying run. But to do that, he would have had to miss a money-making race that he was scheduled to race in, a road race. I think it was a Trans Am race. And uh, he wasn't going to do that. He was going to make this car make a pole position or he's going to die trying. So anyway, back to this amazing situation here. When he comes around the corner, like I said, look at that rear tire. Watch the car as it goes through here and this damn tree that's in the way. And once it comes over here, look at those front tires. You'll see them go, whoosh. I mean like, whoosh, whoosh. and what it is is he's, he, he cannot believe that there's no resistance on the front tires because it tells him what's going on. And it's terrifying. He's, he's, he's all in here. I mean, he's all in. And uh, so the car does its wiggle, and then it does this 
horrendous sideways drift. It's not a slide because there's no smoke from the tires. If you look at this, there's no smoke from tires because guess what? It's not on the track. The only time you get tires is right here and I'll tell you why. What he does is he turns the wheel. Once he turns the wheel you get this situation where you get a wheel like this and a wheel like this and you've got the Venturi's that the air is going into like this but when you turn the wheel like this and like this and the car is still like this suddenly you get the reintroduction of air into these Venturi's and it reintroduces the ground effects to the track and that's what happens here and that's why it, it, it looks like this thing is drifting drifting turns around and boom hits the track and takes off and that's where you get these horrendous black marks but guess what as far as I can tell you only get black marks out the back tires and there's only two reasons you would get this either those tires were spinning because they had been floating in this situation here and he gunned it I mean he he didn't have to gun it they were already he was already floored uh, or he ran the brake balance all the way back and was hoping he could uh, get the car to spin out this way by having the brake balance all the way back I don't think he did that I think he, I think he kept his foot on the floor all the way through the crash and it explains why when you look at this car and it lands and goes up the track like right here then it goes up the track it accelerates at the wall I mean it takes off and then it becomes airborne again it, it does the exact same thing again and it continues until it hits the, the wall and does all the awfulness so this is an amazing failure of the car induced by an impatient driver and he paid for it um, but there's lessons in this for drivers today that you might think you can you know undercut where the groove is on a high-speed track and maybe you need to rethink that and not even even if you're not driving a uh, ground effects car God knows please let's not go back to ground effects cars they're very they're they're wonderful when they work and they're horrendous when they fail when they fail at, they always seem to fail at the highest load time, which the highest load time is at the highest speed down the track, which is usually 190 miles an hour. And there's not enough runoff in the world that's going to let you just go off the track at 190 miles an hour in a, in, a, uh, in a hovercraft and smack a wall and not be really messed up. So we've gone through the crash. I've showed you this right here. I've showed you how you can see this, okay? Those two front tires was, that was a revelation to me. And also the fact that where are the tire tra tracks, tire tracks? And which ones are you seeing? Are you seeing front tire tracks? Are you seeing back tire tracks? Where are the tire tracks? I mean, I see the tire tracks here, right here. I mean, he should have been uh, smoking tires all through here because the car was sideways even without him trying to hit the brakes those tires should have been laying off smoke but they weren't because the car was airborne it it popped up he got his it, he went across the white line uh, the car kinda moved a little sideways off the white line started drifting he gets this kinda wiggle because the tires he goes like this and then the thing does this lazy turn he turns the wheels all the way this way and they act like two uh, airplane uh, ailerons and the car snaps straight and then it just drives itself right up into the wall and this is where the awfulness happens um, so that is how Gordon Smiley crashed Okay. Now we're going to get to the gory 
death. And I view this just as important as I view how the crash happened. Not from a sensationalist standpoint, but to understand the dangers involved in Indy car racing that still are there today for the racers. Because one of the things that killed uh, Gordon Smiley was an impact with a post that smashed the entire left side of his face to bits. I mean, like this. It just completely obliterated it. And I'm going to tell you where that happened. All right. If you want to see the most accurate uh, photos of this situation, you have to go to a uh, put in Gordon Smiley Photos UK, and then it'll come up the fast lane dot com dot co uk and I think it's uh, photos and it'll give you Gordon Smiley photos uk it'll give you two sets of photos one is of the year before the crash any car photos and one is the horrendous photos that they will not show in America. And what you want to look for is the tan photos. Tan photos. And one small photo. So, let's get to this this damn nightmare. Um, Gordon Smiley is impatient. He's Yanked that car at full speed into the corner. He made an assumption that uh, his ground effects would keep the car uh, attached to the track, and it's going to cost him his life. And it's going to cost him his life in the most sensational crash ever recorded, and uh, it's the most sensational one-person crash ever recorded in uh, auto racing history in detail. Now, Le Mans was the most horrific because it killed so many people but this was the most horrific because of the detail in the photos photos details in the photos that you've never seen until you go to that UK site Gordon Smiley photos put UK and then you'll see those pictures from the fast lane now you cannot hot link those photos and you cannot copy those photos so don't try because I try I actually shot a video with some of those photos involved in it and then it, it dawned on me, you know, I'm not going to post something on YouTube that they're going to have to take off. It already says you're not supposed to copy them and you're not supposed to hot link them, so I'm me shooting a video off of my TV on them. It's just pointless. Um, but go there and hopefully they won't uh, take them off because normally when I make a link they take everything off of the link that I post. If that happens then I may be forced to put the video up. I hope not. And we'll have to see. I have to claim American privilege that Gordon Smiley was an American racer and that I'm doing this for uh, public safety reasons of American racers and they can fight the battle if they want to. But I'm not going through that right now. Any case, let's get to the wreck. I mean, the first picture you see of him hitting a wall, I mean, it's just horrendous. Now, down here, there's some really interesting, before he gets there, there's some really interesting pictures of the rear wheel. Uh, some tire tracks, uh, some some tire tracks from the rear wheel, and there's a, like a place here, I don't know if he, if this is where the rear tire hits the, the ground and regains traction, or maybe he slammed on the brakes, but it looks to me like the car is just, going gangbusters. Anyway, he hits the wall here. And what this car does is it goes like this. Although you can't see it. And he's sitting right here 
like this. His feet are out here like this. Steering wheel's here. The wing goes flying off immediately. And here's the wall. And what goes on next is uh, pretty graphic, pretty gross. So if you're not ready for it, don't keep watching. Um, I saw all this on those fast lane pictures and on the other pictures. I'm going to go through the pictures as I can remember them and tell you what you're going to see. First off, this is what Gordon Smiley looked at like through the entire crash. of this accident. Here's the two front wheels. His legs, his broken legs are like this. His arms are, it's just amazing to me that his arms are splayed out like this. And here's his head Late in the accident, Gordon Smiley is being dragged down the track by these two wheels. But this entire situation stays, he stays with these two wheels through the entire crash. And these two wheels are here. His legs are like this. in one of these pictures of the car going up the fence it's going up the fence like this and the cockpit of the car is actually bent in like this this is right after the impact with the wall and the car climbs up the concrete wall and climbs up the fence. And this is where this massive injury in his side came from where the doctor characterized that he said it looked like a shark had taken a bite out of the side of his body. Very important to understand that when he hits this wall, he has massive, massive, uh, his legs are pulverized, his, his pelvis is pulverized, uh, I would not be surprised if all the way up to his sternum isn't pulverized by that crash. So he's, he has got to be out at that point. He is just a passenger after this initial impact. So the rest of this happens with him unconscious. any case, the car goes up like this. And the cockpit bows in and just gouges a big chunk of his body out right here. What happens after this is amazing. I, I just, to me, I, I mean, it's uh, it's just astonishing to see this. Um, the car continues to uh, pull itself to pieces with him like this, and this part starts to turn around because it's starting to spin and what it does is it twists itself like a beer can off of this part of the car but this continues to go forward as when it yanks this part of the car it sends his body like this from that to this he's actually facing that way. He's facing towards the fence. Towards fence. And he's still traveling 180 mile per hour. And judging from the angle of where his helmet is, he hits, these fences have a bar like this at the top. It's like 25 feet up in the air. Now he either hits this bar or he hits this bar very high up here. 
as he goes, continues to go like this. The fence is here, so he's being forced into the fence. When it hits here, that concretely ends his life. Because what it does is, after hitting that, his helmet is knocked off. You can see it in one of the pictures at that uh, the fastlane.com UK. Now you can't get to this by just putting that in there. You got to put in Gordon Smiley Photos UK. And you can see these pictures. You want to look at the tan pictures, tan color pictures. And there's a, a stunningly clear picture of his helmet over here. He's actually past the fence now. And his, his, his body's actually like this. And there is, what you're seeing here is white, which is his balaclava. They all wear a white fire retardant sock. And you can clearly see uh, brain material. Well, you can see blood splatter. Let's just put it that way. Blood spatter coming out of his head here. And the, the, uh, the helmet is way down here. It's like in a perfect uh, angle away from this. Not this, but this. And he's still connected to these two daggone tires. And what it does is I think it, it spins him around this way with the tires. So now he starts going like this down the track. And this is where you find another distressing picture. You see the tires like this. You see his legs sticking out here like this. You see his hands out here like this. And he's... 15 feet off the track, probably doing 150 mile per hour. So the car hits the wall, climbs the wall, he stretches out, it pulls him out like a knife out of a sheath and then it flips him like this because when this part of the car starts spinning at the bottom and yanks itself to tear itself off the top piece, it goes like this and it it imparts a motion to his body where he goes like this there is a heartbreaking picture that's a lot of these pictures are censored but there is a heartbreaking picture of him that exists and we'll never see it I don't think it's on that site but it's it's uh, it's edited and I mean I don't know if you really need to see it but he is up like this, above the crash. He is literally almost at the top of the fence, and his arms are out like this. And I mean, it's, it's just sad. It's just really sad. But that shows you where the impact with the fence comes from. Knocks his helmet right off here and just obliterates the left side of his head. The entire left side of his head is just smashed to pieces. So the car does this spin motion and then you get, like I said, you get this point where his legs are sitting out here, he's 15 feet off the track. You need to understand when you're looking at the pictures, you're going to see uh, a bunch of rear and flaming parts, and then he is on the other side of that, tied in with these damn tires, and they just sling him down the track, all the way down the track, like this. And 
the pictures of him as he slows down, he hits the track and he spins like once I think it is and then it's very odd the tires sort of take a momentum of their own dragging him down the track arms out like this like this and it's dragging him down the track at probably 70 mile per hour at this point but slowing quickly and if you look at the there's two pictures of this um, of him slowing and it's just really heart-wrenching because for some reason I don't know if it was a, a, the, the shoulder strap or something or, but it was pulling his body up so that his body was like this with his arms back like this. Remember, all his bones are broken and the wheels are right here. And his head is just torn to pieces here. Um, the thing to remember that the side is torn to pieces on here is the side that's facing you. Um, but what, what is astonishing to me is there in these two pictures There's a fence here for spectators. And there is a girl here wearing a halter top. And she turned, she is turned around by this time, but has no doubt seen him because she's only maybe 30 feet away from him as he gets dragged down the track. Now when it gets down here, the wheels again spin one time and it yanks his body into the wheels and ties him up into the wheels. And that's where you see the last picture. But this thing that got me most off was this one picture here. Uh, and I mean, it's just astonishing to see that the man lived with his life tied to wheels. He loved to race and the man died because he was tied to wheels all the way to the end of his life. It's almost as if they shot him out of a cannon like that and that's what he wound up being. That's important to remember when he's up at the top of the fence like this that he's facing that way. This is the back of his head. But you can follow him all the way through the crash because he has a logo on the back of this and he has a bright white driving suit. And every place in the crash you see a long stretch of white that looks like a leg, that's a leg. You see an arm, it looks like an arm. Now there's one small picture on that site that shows him He's over here, he's laying, it's a long shot, he's laying down here, his arms like this, this massive crap is over here, but you get to see his face like this, and the wheels are here, and here, and this whole side of his face is gone. So that's... That's what, that's what the, the injury was. He, he was not scalped. The injury was this. The injury was a 180 mile an hour impact with a fence post. That's what blew his, it completely knocked his helmet off uh, actually, if we want to be accurate for your sakes, knocked it off this way and smashed this side of his face and just obliterated it. 
So he got the car went up. When the car went up, he's sitting in a uh, heavy-duty aluminum riveted body, and the and the heavy-duty aluminum just cut him open. The car tears itself apart. The, he's tied to the front wheels. The bottom part spins around and yanks itself off of the front part of the car, and that flips him up into the fence, and then he immediately hits this post, which knocks his helmet off, crushes the entire left side of his head, gets him spinning around like this. He lands on the track. He gets dragged down the track. At some point in the track, you see two pictures of him like this, where he's literally, it's just very odd that it actually brought him up from the track like almost the devil was trying to show people this guy, you know. Look what I did, you know. But And then it finally, he crumpled down over here. So it was a horrendous, horrendous accident. Uh, and the fence thing, I'm going to reference to later because... Uh, that could happen. As a matter of fact, that has happened. You know who it's happened to. Um, so that's the end of the gory death. Um, Gordon Smiley's wife said that, uh, well, if my husband had not died at Indy, he would never have been famous. If he had died on a track in Europe and in a situation where it was never filmed, he would have never been famous. And she's absolutely correct. He actually is the uh, the call to arms to make the cars and this track safer. But they still had accidents. I mean, um, <laughs> let me just read out some of these accidents they had because I'm not going to write them all down. I got some of these written down here. Okay, in 1973, Sweet Savage had a horrendous crash, uh, burned, thrown from the car during a race. The car tore to pieces. In 1981, Danny Gaius had a horrendous crash, took the whole front of his car off, shattered his legs, similar to what he went through, but he didn't go up on the wall because Gaius was probably trying to uh, obey the rules of Indy. Gordon Smiley, we already talked about him in May 15, 1982 the most famous single car crash in opening wheel history. Uh, Nelson Piquet Sr. This was uh, this was May 7th, 1992. Nelson Piquet Sr. was one of the most uh, flamboyant and exciting racers to watch in Formula One. And he was like Ayrton Senna before Ayrton Senna was Ayrton Senna. As a matter of fact, he may have inspired Ayrton Senna in a lot of ways. But uh, he was just a crazy dude, and he was fun to watch. And he got out of, he raced in uh, Formula One, and as far as I know, he never got severely injured. I might be wrong about that, but as far as I remember, he never got severely injured. He came to IndyCar, and on May 7, 1992, he was uh, in practice and he spun out and the picture of his car okay, this this is actually the fence the fence and this is his car his helmet is against the fence his legs must be broken like looking down here's his helmet his legs must be broken out this way because here's the car and this crash made me want to puke because I was following Nelson PK when he came over and I thought he was going to do well he was going to kick some ass and I don't, you know, the thing is kind of, American racers is a strange thing because American racers have always accepted that Indy was dangerous and that we were going to lose some people. And it was a strange thing. I don't know. It really turned me off to Indy car racing for quite a few years because, I mean, the guy just busted his legs to pieces. And the picture that you see, uh, May 7, 1992 of uh, Nelson Piquet's car. If you, ever, you need to see that picture. 
you will not believe he survived that crash. All right, uh, a year later, uh, actually not a year later, I'm sorry, just uh, nine days later, Jovi Marcella dies. He was qualifying, went straight into the turn one wall. I'm going to jump up to Dan Weldon. And we know what happened with Dan Weldon. Uh, car rose up off the track. And there was a fence post. And the way that it describes it is, the way that the report is, is that the fence post got into the chassis, it broke into the chassis, and then it subjected Dan Weldon's head to horrendous forces. No doubt, sh I would say no doubt shattering his helmet. I don't know, they never, they never said what the, qual the, what the condition of his helmet was and stuff when they got there. They just gave off a lot of uh, numbers, but this crash that killed Dan Weldon happened uh, October 16th, 2011. Okay. Now this is uh, 2019, and well, we got eight, eight years here. Eight years. Eight years here. Okay. And. You know, you got uh, May 15th, 1982, you got Gordon Smiley here. Now granted Mr. Smiley's injuries, he had three sets of horrific injuries. Uh, I mean, all his bones were broke. Uh, the injury to his side alone would have killed him. But hitting this post is something that uh, definitely destroyed his life. And as far as Dan Wilden goes, it destroyed his life. And we just had Rosenquist on uh, August 18th, 2019. He almost went into defense. Now, I'm not going to forget you, Mr. Wickens. And he went up off the track. So, IndyCar needs to get off their butts and put some head protection in those cars. Um, uh, I wasn't a fan of the Halo when I first saw it. I was like, this is stupid. But when I thought about it, and I thought about uh, Maria Delavota, and I thought about, um, oh, what the hell is his name? I'm not going to remember it. Anyway, the young man who uh, crashed under the truck. I don't see how you can't can put a guy or a girl in a race car without that. Uh, uh, Jules Bianchi. I mean Jules Bianchi and Maria Della Voda. See her brain x-ray photo. She lived, she was at a press event and she was driving up one of the Formula One cars and for some unknown reason it didn't stop. She went to hit the brakes and she just didn't stop in time. She ran under a truck and she did exactly what Jules Bianchi did, which was she hit her helmet. was the only thing stopping the car underneath the trailer. And it crushed her brain, it crushed her skull to pieces, but she lived after that. Um, I don't think she should have come back into the public eye as fast as she did. I think that that was a mistake. I think that 
Uh, but then you can think whatever you want to. She did what she wanted to. It's a miracle that she survived as long as she did. But the halo is a great thing. Unfortunately, we just had a F2 crash uh, this weekend that uh, killed a young man because people don't know that a runoff is a runoff area. And there's problems in that too. But IndyCar needs to start thinking really about the uh, comprehensive driver safety capsule. Now we see these things, Formula One shows the pictures of the uh, carbon fiber cockpits and all that are open. Um, and if any car, I don't, you know, I actually like the Halo. I think the Halo is a great idea. I think it performs a function that uh, that would probably do well. I think if IndyCar did that, they would have to make the down spanner in front of the drivers wider because of that post. Because I don't, then you know what you do when you do that. I mean, when you do a test on this, if you have whatever you have, you have the halo here like this, and I mean, you put a fence post like this and you mount it solidly. And you shoot this at the fence post at 220 mile per hour on rails. And you see what it'll do. You know, you shoot this sucker this way. And you see what it'll do. And if it doesn't stop that post from getting to that driver, then you change it. But they need to do something to protect the driver's heads. Um, and one more thing, at Pocono, when they, when they fixed the fence, what I saw was, this is what the people who were fixing the fence was using. These were metal posts. It looked like a gate that they were tying up to the fence. Like this. These are metal posts. Metal posts. That's what I saw. And I'm like going, uh, does anybody understand the stupidity of tying this where a car can hit it and knock it back into the driver's faces? Uh, but anyway, I mean, that's what I saw. I don't know I thought they would have weaved this, uh, a piece of fence in here and just weaved it in here like this, you know? Somehow, I don't know, or put uh, cables across the back of it or something, but not put daggone steel posts up here like that. In any case, the comprehensive driver safety capsule is something that any car really needs to get up their ass about, and they need to do it before next year. And if they're not going to do it, they need to do something more than this. Although, you know, I... Sh I said bad things about this shark fin but I'm telling you I saw Rossi and that crash where Rossi's in the car and and Sato comes over like this and and here is Rossi his car front and there's a shark fin. I swear it seems to me like Sato's uh, undercarriage hits that shark fin and gets deflected back off the car. So even that shark fin made a difference. They showed where the shark fin knocked a piece of carbon fiber away from the driver, but this is an entire race car. I heard a sound that sounded to me like these two pieces came in contact with each other and Sato got knocked off of uh, Rossi's car and uh, and it wasn't any worse than it was because that shark fin helped him. So the shark fin is better than nothing uh, but they need to put something all the way up here. I mean they really do. It needs to happen. They need to protect it. The post will kill you. Post Fence posts will kill you. Helmet or not. 
So, I mean, that, that's the end of it. I mean, uh, I've, I've had Gordon Smiley dying in my head for about 100 hours now, and now I can say that I've made my contribution to people understanding what happened to him. Uh, I feel sorry for his widow. She apparently still lives in the area, still lives in the same house. Um, I feel sorry for everybody who liked the guy. Uh, I feel sorry for every aspiring Formula One guy who, or girl who's fighting right now. Just tell him to think about the Gordon Smiley story. Don't get so impatient that you throw your life away. Um, it was a sad, sad day. Every time we lose a racer, just like we just did with Herbert in F2, it's a sad day. Especially when we can prevent it. We can prevent that. Um, just have to put the effort forward. But the drivers have to put their effort forward to stay within the confines of the track and within the limitations of their vehicles. I mean, you can always take a car in a situation and drive it off a track and find something that's going to kill you. And there's no engineer that's going to stop that. You have to be the one behind the wheel that says, okay, I'm off the groove, I'm sliding loose, let me get, let me attenuate my speed. You know, I'm off the track, I'm on the runoff, I'm not on the track, it's not time to go passing people. I gotta slow down, I gotta attenuate my speed, what's going on ahead of me? So, I hope that IndyCar comes up with something. I don't want to see another racer uh, get his head blowed open like Gordon Smiley did or unfortunately like Dan Weldon did. Um, those fence posts are dangerous as hell, but they're a necessary fact of life for these racers. You, you can't, and they save uh, spectators at every NASCAR track. Every NASCAR race, they save spectators. Unfortunately, in this situation, you've got a much less protected driver. So we've got to get some more protection for the drivers. Rest in peace, Gordon Smiley. I hope I did you fairly. I uh, wish you hadn't uh, uh, done the things you did, but we only get one chance to get through this life, and every decision you make matters. And an in infinitely important, that is the lesson Gordon Smiley teaches people, is that he was an accomplished road racer, but the bar he set for himself was so high that only Formula One would have mattered. And he knew he wasn't going to get there. And he was so frustrated and angry, and that he had to go racing. He had to miss a uh, a money, potentially money making race if he didn't qualify this day. He was determined to make that qualifying run and drive the car in ways he knew were very, very risky, and it killed him. So anyway, God bless everybody. Uh, condolences to Mr. Herbert's family. Um, I hope Mr. Korea's legs heal fully in F2. Um, Mr. Wickens, I hope that you get better and you're able to walk to your fiance's side at your wedding. And let's just try to make these cars safer. And one last thing. Everybody talks about how the cars are too fast. Everybody. Formula One does, IndyCar does. And yet, the engineers continually make the cockpits as light as possible. And they continually make the protection for the driver's faces as light as possible. They're always looking for a way to make things lighter. You have to regulate in that those cockpits have thick carbon fiber, thick protection, that the tow boxes will not fail. There's no reason for a tow box to fail and for a driver's legs to get crushed. That should never happen. Not in any car, not in Formula One. Okay? So let's have some great racing, some safe racing, Let's try to get rid of them damn asphalt runoffs and put gravel back in to keep drivers on the track. And let's have a good 2020 on. God bless everyone.